Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and thank you for joining us to celebrate the life of uh, a very dear person, someone whom we've all admired and greatly appreciated, and in this very institution, we've had the great privilege of being with him. Subir Gokharan is no more with us, but we will use today's opportunity to celebrate his life and his work. And I'm very grateful to all of you for joining us, and I'm very grateful to my colleagues, T.N. Nainan and Shamika Ravi and Kabir Vasudeva uh, of Business Standard and Brookings India to join in this uh, memorial to Subir. And it's emblematic of Subir's life that even in his passing away, he brings people together. And it's really a hallmark of the way he functioned and the greatness of his mind and his um, approach to life that uh, we are here to celebrate today. I'll briefly say a few things about um, Subir's background, though it hardly needs much uh, introduction to all of you. He started his career at the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research, eventually becoming an associate professor by the year 2000. Uh, 1999, and then he joined NCR as a chief economist and the IFCI chair, was here with us for uh, intense, but in our minds too brief, a period of three years. Thereafter went on to become the chief economist of Crystal, and then when Crystal was taken over by SNP, SNP Asia Pacific, thereafter, uh, of course, he then went on to be the governor, the deputy governor of the Reserve Bank at uh, youngest uh, deputy governor uh, at the age of 49. Um, thereafter, research director at Brookings India, um, helping this new institution establish itself and grow, and I'm sure Shamika will have things to say about that. Um, and thereafter, as the executive director um, to the IMF for India, Bhutan, and Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. Um, I had the great privilege of uh, working with Subir very closely. Uh, I was not here, but my colleagues, uh, my former colleagues and former uh, predecessors at uh, NCER, Rakesh Mohan, who uh, persuaded so we had to come to NCER and then Suman, who was here uh, towards the end of uh, Subir's stay with us. Um, I'm sure they will have a few things to say about uh, his stay here. Um, I had the great privilege of working with Subir uh, as the co-editor of uh, something we actually started with Brookings many years back, but then uh, did on our own the India Policy Forum, and for two wonderful years, he was my co-editor. Uh, and co-editors have the great <laughs> pleasure or pain of working very closely with recalcitrant uh, authors and recalcitrant um, discussants. And so we had a great time getting to know each other very well. And in that period, I truly enjoyed uh, the hundreds of emails we must have exchanged. Um, he was already on his way to Washington at that point, but even at that point, he said he would uh, stand by his commitment and complete one more round of the India Policy Forum. Um, I thought I would just read out the letter that he wrote uh, to Suman when he was leaving NCER, and I'll quote from that letter written in January 2002. The three years I spent here have been a time of significant personal and professional growth for me. Coming from a traditional academic background, I found myself untested in many of the skills needed to be effective in my position at NCER. Managing relationships with a variety of clients and motivating colleagues from a variety of professional and cultural backgrounds while trying to maintain a reasonable standard of academic rigor and integrity was an enormous challenge. I would like to believe that I met the challenge. In doing so, 
I know that I gained enormously. I would also like to believe that I reciprocated fully, both in terms of contributing to the public profile and reputation of the Council, and in terms of my interactions with the various researchers who worked with me. I think this so embodies uh, his sense of both learning, giving, and the generous person that he was. I'd like to end um, by again pointing to the enormous friendships that he built over the years. And this is a letter he wrote to the person who now is my executive assistant, Sudesh Bala. I think she is right here. And he was at the Reserve Bank then. And he wrote a letter um, eight years after he had left NCER. Uh, and in that letter, he talks about how, when he arrived, Sudesh was a stenographer. Those were the days of stenography. And he said, look, I don't need a stenographer. I'm going to use my own computer and type. And then he describes the way in which Sudesh went ahead and transformed her job from being a stenographer to being a personal assistant. And he, eight years later, remembers that, recommends to NCER that her career should progress faster. And that just shows the kind of man that Subir was. We will remember him greatly. I'd like to now request TN Nainan to say a few words. Um, thank you, Shekhar, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I don't recall when exactly Subir began writing his column in Business Standard. What I do recall is Ashok Desai uh, pointing him out at the first Nimrana Conference of Economists 20 years ago. Uh, Subir, I think, was not yet 40 at the time. And um, telling me uh, that he was a very good young economist. Um, Subir had been tasked with organizing administratively the Nimrana Conference. And I did get a chance to chat with him briefly. And not long afterwards, uh, TCA Srinivas Raghavan, uh, who is another colleague, uh, suggested uh, that we invite Shubhi to write a fortnightly column, and that's how it began. A couple of years later, we started in the office a sort of Monday morning brain trust, um, to which we invited a few of our uh, distinguished columnists uh, to join the staff in uh, indulging in some gossip and then discussing some of the issues to take up uh, in the editorials in the, in the rest of the week that would follow. And uh, that is how Subir became a more integral part of the paper. He'd be there every Monday morning. Um, invariably, he would come to the meeting straight from the gym and the swimming pool at the Habitat Center. And he would bring with him a box of cookies that he'd bought at Habitat. Uh, the Business Standard Office has some biscuit champions, um, including myself. So the cookies disappeared very quickly. Um, at some stage, uh, Sweet also began writing some of the newspaper's editorials. Um, and uh, progressively, he became the author of most of the ones involving economic policy and macroeconomics. Unsigned, of course. Um, he wrote very quickly. Uh, the prose was tidy and he had no problem following whatever editorial line had been laid down. Uh, he described himself in this exercise as a keyboard for hire. Um, his column, of course, was his own. Um, it reflected his personality, uh, not his leonine looks with a mane of hair, uh, but the articles that appeared every fortnight on Mondays were thoughtful, balanced, and restrained. Uh, importantly, his judgments were sound. And I will come to that in a moment. It was in June, less than two months ago, that he came to our Monday meeting for the last time. He happened to be in Delhi on an IMF trip. Uh, we had lost a lot of weight. Um, and while the issue, uh, the reason for that was his illness, uh, the fact is he looked lean and trim and fit. Um, he felt he'd licked the cancer. He was optimistic about the future and talked about uh, 
planning to come back and settle down in Mumbai uh, once his term at the IMF was over. And then he was gone in a month. Uh, it was a shock for me to get a call from Washington to be told the doctors had given up and that the end would be soon. Sameed is not the kind of person about whom people tell stories. Um, he was reserved and taciturn. He was not gregarious and not on the social circuit. But there is a surprising range of people who got in touch with me to offer condolences. And for those of you who missed it, I would recommend reading Dr. Subarao's very appropriate piece that we carried in the paper last Saturday in the weekend section. Uh, Subarao writes that Subir Oh, you're going to read it out. Okay, perfect. Uh, right, that Subir would convey a great deal with a glint in his eye or with a wry comment. And that is enough for you to know where he stood or where you stood with him. Uh, and still the truth is that he was popular with younger colleagues at the paper. Um, he was completely unaffected by the progressively elevated positions he held in life. And he was actually an interesting person. Uh, he had a large collection of blues and jazz music, and as Konika, who's here, informs me, he named his column Muddy Waters after a famous blues singer, songwriter, and guitarist. Subir is also a foodie, and Dr. Subarao writes of how Subir invited him to his home to a special meal that Subir had personally cooked for him. I gather also that he loved driving. First, a red Maruti, in which he drove his father from Mumbai to Goa and that became a travel piece in the paper. Later, it was an Innova, in which once he drove uh, to Jaipur from Delhi in a flat three hours. And you can imagine the sight on the road, Subir with all that hair going at 120 kilometers an hour. On a personal note, Subir's daughter and I share a birthday. So he was always the first to wish me. And since I'm a late riser, he always beat me to the draw every time. Uh, once I made the mistake of telling him that I was trying to learn the piano. And ever after that, he would keep asking me when I would perform for him. I don't think he really wanted to listen. He had that glint in his eye which said he was enjoying my embarrassed excuses. Um, I'd like to close by referring to some of his columns. Um, you know, newspapers uh, pieces are written for the day. They're not written for history. But a good column will survive the test of time. So let me read what Subir wrote, a couple of pieces in 2013, and then a closing piece which reflects, um, gives you some idea of the wry humor that he could bring out. Um, late 2013, November, uh, he talked about how we could get back uh, to rapid growth. And this was a time of uh, policy paralysis. Um, the elections are not far away, and a new government is likely to be in office. And uh, he said that uh, getting back to and sustaining rapid growth needs some serious rethinking of the roles that the state needs to play. And he defined it in very clear terms. A convenient way to look at this issue is to divide state roles into two categories. One might be called enabling and the other delivery. The distinction, uh, and then he, he goes on to say the core instrumentalities of the enabling role are regulatory institutions and frameworks, while the main requirements of the delivery role are execution capabilities and accountability mechanisms. And he says that over the previous 22 years, the Indian economy swung quite tangibly from the delivery to the enabling role, but the routine aggravation of structural constraints also suggests that the right balance between roles has not been achieved. And he closes the column by saying, we have come to terms with the reality that our state may be the biggest stumbling block to sustain the economic performance. But if we can't live with it, we can't without it either. Change is imperative. And it's interesting that the government that followed uh, has focused on delivery and moved away from enabling. And it's an interesting transition that's happened, which in a somewhat prescient way, uh, he almost saw coming. Um, the other piece that he wrote roughly at the same time, a little later, uh, was on what needs to be done. And again, looking back at it uh, five and a half years later, um, it's interesting to see what he picked out as the themes. Uh, one is the need to do something radical in agriculture. 
Uh, this requires both an overall enhancement of productivity and a major reallocation of land between crops. Two, the promise that the public-private partnership model for infrastructure development initially made seems to have been oversold. Three, the sharp increase in the current account deficit is largely the result of the inability to exploit our mineral resources in a transparent, equitable, and sustainable way. Uh, these resources should and can be a source of great competitive advantage, but it needs an appropriate policy and regulatory framework. And four, the rate at which we are creating desirable jobs is far below requirements. The demographic dividend is fast turning into a time bomb. And that could have been written today. And the last piece, which is a different aspect of his personality. Uh, soon after we moved to Mumbai a few years ago, we were informed that our dog needed a license from the municipal authorities. Not wanting the favorite member of the family deemed an illegal alien, we set out to obtain one. We entered the building with trepidation, born out of years of frustrating and mind-numbing encounters in government offices, expecting to spend much of the day moving from one counter and one queue to another. Not to mention the dust, grime, and stacks of musty files. We need not have worried. The customer-facing part of this particular office had clearly been redone with e-governance in mind. A number of counters, all with desktops, a large waiting area, and best of all, hardly any queues greeted us. I reached the counter and requested a dog license. Instantaneously, a form appeared on the screen. Name, father's name, dog's name, etc. When the dog's breed was mentioned, the dog shunned, a drop-down menu appeared. Standard or miniature? <laughs> Smooth, wiry, or long head? I was impressed. Then came the first hurdle. Dog's age. Eight. Months or years? No, years. Hesitation and a worried look on the other side of the counter. She then asked me to wait and called a huddle with her colleagues. My heart sank. It didn't take them very long, though. She came back and told me that the system did not allow her to issue a new license for an eight-year-old dog. She only could renew an existing license. A new license was issuable only to a dog less than one year old. The empire strikes back. I said that we just moved from New Delhi, so I couldn't have gotten a Mumbai license before this in any case. But apparently, there was no provision for adult dogs relocating to Mumbai. I asked how much the license fee was. She said it was 100 rupees a year. 100? I offered a solution. Let me pay the back dues, 800 in all, and you issue me licenses for his whole lifespan. She called another huddle. And reassured by her colleagues, agreed to this proposal. In and out in about 20 minutes. Not bad at all. But then came the second twist. Go upstairs and get a signature, I was told my old fears came rushing back. I walked up the stairs, and with every step, the old stereotype of government offices came more and more into view. I found the room, entered, and was directed to a desk that was predictably unoccupied. No one else in the room volunteered any information, so I just waited. Amidst the dust, grime, and musty files. Fortunately, the person returned in a few minutes, he looked at me as though I was something he'd scraped off his shoe, but took the license and signed it without a word. No perceptible value was added by this process, but it took just another 10 minutes, and, and he showed me a look that I've been trying to imitate since. <laughs> Shamika. Thank you, Shekhar. Oh, it's just so befitting. Uh, every time I think of uh, Shabir, and I'm glad Nainan, you brought out, uh, you know, uh, the last several years of his life. Uh, it seems really fresh, each of these pieces that uh, you read out. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to quote uh, some personal episodes uh, because it, it matters a great deal to me, and I represent here uh, a startup. You know, Brookings India truly was uh, a startup. We are, we are just into the sixth year. 
uh, and and for someone who had been in uh, uh, in academia for the last 15 years to make a jump into this unknown um, new organization uh, it, I was doing it with a lot of trepidation and and there was this person at the other end of the table firmly uh, well placed who said don't worry we will build this together if we continue to do good work uh, there should be no problem and and so he truly was an elder to me uh, and and as you all know uh, Delhi can be a bit maddening uh, for, for people who are moving uh, you know newly into uh, Delhi and the policy space where I think academic research has has a role but impact is another uh, world on together you know altogether and what Shubir was able to uh, help me personally with was how do you how do you overcome a lot of these things through humor? He just, he just carried everything so lightly. And, and in the process, I think it became a part of the culture of the institution. That while research was, is, is most often a lonely process, it's you and the data and the computer, perhaps a few co-authors, impact can be hugely frustrating. So it helps to have someone like him around who basically says, you know what, you, you, you live to fight another day, it's not a big deal, let me tell you last, 30 years of my life, how, how, how uh, we've sort of overcome and laughed many of these uh, frustrations off. Having an elder uh, in the profession uh, from a day-to-day -day basis made an enormous, enormous uh, impact on me. I had not moved to Delhi with the intention of staying on and now I'm here in, in my sixth year here. Uh, if it wasn't for Shubir, I would probably have been back in Hyderabad at the end of the first year. So truly, uh, 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 a wonderful uh, elder, uh, a great director to have in the institution who helped to ally fears by sticking to the basic principles of, of research and, and, and what impact is. The other thing which he impressed upon me personally was also the need for communication. Uh, many of us in the research space really don't take out the time and energy or make great efforts in communicating our ideas with the, with the outside world. And Shubir, uh, through I think uh, also the, the business standard, uh, uh, his, his relationship, did impress upon us, uh, you know, the younger scholars within the institution, that that effort needed to be made if, if you want people to uh, read and, and sort of follow some of the prescriptions. Curation of events required a great deal of effort, but not just the people, also the food. In fact, you'd be surprised how much effort uh, Brookings India uh, used to put in, in curation of events and why the food had to be right, and, and it made a huge impact. Uh, so it was just wonderful for all of us to have that kind of a force uh, uh, around. Um, you know, we wrote a book together uh, and, and on education. It was new to both of us and that opened uh, many of us to a new uh, form of policy research which was highly consultative. So he also opened the doors for uh, policy research which went beyond uh, the kind of academic scholarship which most of us are prone to, which is really going to the MCD schools, t talking to the teachers. Now those of you who do empirical research, unless the samples are large enough, uh, those efforts really, you know, you don't bother putting in that much effort. But uh, Shubir was able to uh, convince me that, that making all those visits to the MCD school basically gave you qualitative insight into why things don't function uh, and, and that helped each of us uh, evolve as researchers and, and sort of make that leap uh, from an academic view of, of, of the economy uh, uh, to a policy view. I mean, there are many institutional details which, which we have no idea uh, when we write these papers and he did do a lot of hand-holding into making uh, sort of that transition easy for, for several of us. Uh, between him and me, who were the only two people in the beginning of the institution, the average height of the institution was actually average. And then of course Rakesh joined us and, and, and I felt... Uh, <laughs> Shubir was... I mean, I, all my memories of him uh, uh, are, are very fond, uh, but what I, what I have learned from him uh, as a researcher is, is, is the power of humor uh, in, in the lives that we all lead as researchers, uh, which can sometimes get increasingly, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of desolate because of the nature of the, the exercise. Uh, so we've all learned a great deal for him and, and we also have some younger colleagues uh, in the audience from Brookings who, who will perhaps get an opportunity to also uh, uh,
talk about him. Uh, and our well wishes and, and uh, thoughts and prayers for Jyotsna and Kanak, uh, who, who were very regular, they were part of the family. They visited us often in that Innova car that you referred to, uh, and we did take many rides together uh, to meet different people across town uh, or just to go and get a meal. So it was just, uh, uh, you know, it was a part of growing up, uh, and we are deeply indebted uh, to the scholar uh, and gentleman, uh, Shubir Gokan. Thank you. <coughs> Rakesh. Thank you, Shekhar. Um, I'm first uh, going to say a few things uh, about Shubir, and then I'll end by reading um, Dr. Subarao's very moving and eloquent tribute. Because as I was thinking of writing something to say today, then I got his piece, and I thought there's no way uh, that I could match what he's said. And it's just so moving, so correct and so personal that I will end up by, uh, by reading that out. First, um, I have had the, uh, now when I have to say, I've had the good fortune, um, having known Subir for about 20 years, just about 20 years, from the time that I succeeded in stealing him away from Kirit uh, Parekh here, from IGIDR to come to the much brighter, uh, environs of NCIR in 1998 or 1999. Um, and so that's the time from which uh, I've known him. Um, before anything else, I want to just mention one thing which I, hadn't, which I, which I had no direct experience of, um, of how he treated people working for him. And also, I will come to know just in the last few days, of uh, how he liked to mentor young people, um, which he enjoyed and sought to do, actually. I had not known that, quite frankly. Um, last Tuesday, when he passed, um, <coughs> I got a call from a mutual PS in the Reserve Bank, uh, Rajiv Subramaniam, at about 3 p.m. last Tuesday, saying, do you know that Subir is ill? I said, yeah, I know he's, I know he's <coughs> he's not been well since the last year, but uh, I thought he was recovering. So, and I, and I said, I knew there's some cancer had come back. So she said, no, he's in hospital and please call Jyotsna. So I'm just relating this in the sense that <coughs> he left the Reserve Bank uh, in 2013, or I think 2013. It's now six years since then. It's his former PS keeping in touch with the family so that she knew what was going on with him and cared enough to then call me, his predecessor, to tell me uh, about him. As after I got that call, I called Jyotsna. Um, she was unfortunately alone with him in the hospital. And um, the doctors had, as Nainan mentioned, had basically said that, look, not much can be done. And she was wondering what to do and so on. So one thing I did was to call our other mutual PS, uh, Ravi, in IMF in Washington. And I, so Ravi said, yes, I knew he was not well, but I didn't know he was in hospital. So he immediately rushed there. And I was relating this that Ravi again cared enough that he's basically been helping Jotsta through this all of last week and continuing with all the various paperwork and so on. And then the, the kind of care he took of the people who worked for him that they just go out of their way to, uh, to then be with the family and help. Um, as I said, I've known him for about 20 years, ever since uh, I succeeded in getting him here at NCIR as chief economist, uh, uh, which I think was a title I invented around that time um, uh, for the macro group at NCIR. Um, he brought, in some sense, a new perspective to some of the macro work here. Uh, NCR has always very correctly been data and very and macro and uh, model oriented, but in some sense he brought new insight and intuition. And I think his following work both at uh, Crystal uh, and SNP uh, and the Reserve Bank that he he had a certain what we call feel and intuition for macro. Uh, it was not just numbers in terms of looking at the models, looking at the data, which of course he did. He was of course very data and model based as well. But it was that additional insights that he offered, 
which I thought that really added to <coughs> the kind of work we used to do at uh, NCIR, and also helped, quite frankly, in projecting much better uh, our analyses in macro, in macro projections, which I'm glad to see that uh, NCR is continuing that macro projection on a, a quarterly basis, right, uh, Shekhar? So that is how I first got to know him. And then um, I only worked with him for, I think, a year and a half or two. Um, the first NBER Nimrana conference, uh, NCAR NBER Nimrana conference, which we organized in 1999, uh, December, if I remember correctly. Um, Raghuram, Ra the, it, Marty Feldstein was actually, this is, um, we also lost Marty Feldstein a couple of months ago. Marty Feldstein was the chairman of uh, the president of NBER. Um, I was the director general here. And Raghu Rajan uh, from the NBER side was going to organize the conference. And I asked Shubir to organize it from this side. And uh, what stands out in my memory from that is one, that he just organized that quietly and effortlessly. I really didn't have to do anything. Uh, I'm always happy when that happens. Um, from the, uh, I think the only, my main contribution in organizing the conference was the allocation of rooms. Because every room is different in Nimrana, so it's very important to get the right room for the right person. So that was my main contribution. But he organized the program and totally effortlessly, quietly, and also, again, um, the uh, organization of the menu, the drinks, everything, that from, from the substantive organization to uh, the other. And what is amazing is that over 20 years, that model of the NBR, NCR, Nimrana conference has not changed. And that was set in place by Subir. And again, the way he works is that he, it wasn't the case that he was kind of projecting himself. He just did it. Uh, it, it he never came into the picture. Anyone, I think some of you are here who went to the first Nimrana conference. You probably wouldn't even have known that it was to be organized. That's how he was. Uh, ultimate professional. Uh, he did his job, never self-seeking, never seeking the limelight, but just doing, doing his job. Um, we've been crisscrossing each other in the sense that uh, we worked here together at NCIR. Uh, then he succeeded me uh, as Deputy Governor in the Reserve Bank of India. And then he succeeded me at the IMF as Executive Director. And then I succeeded him at Brookings for a short period of time as the Director in, in Brookings. So in that sense, we've just been crisscrossing each other and therefore we've always uh, kept in touch. Um, in Brookings, uh, when you first started Brookings, which uh, Shamika was talking about, they had a very, I guess you started in Vikram's house, isn't it? Um, so, and then in a small flat in Defense Colony. So here's someone who had been the head of Crystal, the head of SNP, the deputy governor, et cetera, with, you know, deputy governors have staff of hundreds and so on. Very happy doing his work in this really modest office, uh, first in Vikram's house and then Vikram Mehta's house. And then defense, and again, that's why he was very, very uh, self, uh, self-effacing. Um, also, uh, I met. I uh, uh, he, he'd, he he was diagnosed uh, with cancer last, I guess, June or July, and I met him in October, just after he'd come out and was at home after surgery. And just typical should be just totally matter of fact. Yes, I had it. Yeah, it's okay. Um, I'll be back in office uh, next week. Um, then again, uh, then of course you went through uh, the, the long uh, treatment that you have to have in that unfortunate disease. I met him in April at the spring meetings in Washington. He had recovered, but he was very realistic. He had recovered. He said, well, you know, but uh, I'm living on borrowed, borrowed time, so I have no illusions. Uh, but he seemed to have recovered uh, at that time. And then, of course, uh, last week, the uh, end uh, came very fast. Um, he was really a valued colleague, a valued friend, and um, really a, a, a deep and compassionate uh, human being. Let me now uh, read what Subar Dr. Subarao has written. Um, I started with people who worked for him, now someone who he worked for. Um, the first sentence is sort of typical. So I'm just now reading what Subarao has written. 
Subir never smiled. He didn't have to. He could communicate virtually everything, as Nainan, I think, quoted this sentence, virtually everything with a mischievous glint in his eye. Amusement, appreciation, agreement, as well as disapproval and disappointment. I hope he gave a lot of that to Suvara when he was there at the Reserve Bank. He used that glint to great effect to keep me, his boss and colleague on the RBI on track. I couldn't have asked for more. In our years together in the RBI, he proved to be a competent and understanding colleague and in time became a trusted friend and endearing well-wisher. That unsmiling demeanor masked a keen sense of humor which Shameka was much more conscious of his humor than his unsmiling face. He once substituted for me, that is Subarao, at the IMF meetings in Washington, accompanying Finance Minister Pranab Mukherjee. A couple of weeks later, when I met Pranab Mukherjee in Delhi, uh, incidentally, I hope you know Pranab Mukherjee is getting the Bharat Ratna tomorrow, uh, he told me how impressed he was by Shubhira's intervention in Washington meeting. Back in Mumbai, I related this conversation to Shubir, thinking he would be flattered. Should be a dead band. How does the FM know? He wasn't even there when I spoke. <laughs> that was should be down to earth and brutally frank. I recall the first time I met him, a rainy July afternoon in the RBI's Delhi office. Rakesh Mohan, who was deputy governor, decided to move on six months after I joined as governor. And I had to find a successor uh, to fill Rakesh's shoes. Many talented, well-known economists of the country met me to express an interest in the job. Shubir wasn't one of them. In a chance encounter, T. N. Nainan of Business Standard asked me if I had thought of Shubir, a regular columnist for their paper, whom he regarded very light, highly. I invited Shubir to come and see me. During that meeting, our conversation covered a variety of topics, global Indian economics, central banking during the crisis, his family and mine, comparison of living in Delhi versus living in Mumbai. Even halfway through the interview, I knew I had my man. One of the few wise decisions I made as governor. If I had known that, I wouldn't have encouraged some other friends to apply for that job uh, at that time. Shubir was an outstanding macroeconomist who brought a keen sense of the market to bear on RBI policies. I was impressed by his sharp intellect, his ability to connect the dots in understanding complex issues, and the way he built a robust national rationale for our policies. The weekend before each policy meeting, we would gather to pore over the draft document, analyzing the rationale, sharpening the nuancing, and even arguing over English grammar. Inevitably, we would decide to recast some portions, both of us sharing the burden of rewriting. Shubir invariably finished his homework earlier, first, typically writing about 500 words within half an hour, even as would be agonizing for half a day. This must be your training, uh, as a journalist. In the meetings, he spoke selectively, but when he did, he was heard with respect because of the insights he brought to bear on issues. One of the things I noticed in my long career in the IAS, ending with my stint in the RBI, was that all of us have a bias for the glamorous stuff, focusing on the things that would get us recognition and reward, and tend to neglect stuff that is important but unglamorous. Shubir bucked the trend. He was once calling a meeting of RBI chair professors from across the country and I had asked that I chair the meeting. I begged off, saying my plate was full, please handle that meeting. I would definitely make time for the next. The glint of disapproval was clearly evident in his eyes. In the event, I did go to the meeting and found the interaction with academics to be a rewarding learning opportunity. This clearly was not a market-moving event. No newspaper was going to waste column inches, not even nine in, in writing about the RBI top brass meeting the academia, and that didn't deter Shubir from doing what he thought was hugely important. That Shubir was a foodie, which others have referred to, a great cook, a fan of Master Chef Australia is well known. But I didn't know that. Uh, when US Treasury Secretary Geithner and Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke visited RBI, the lunch we were hosting them uh, got scheduled for 11 a.m. to accommodate their travel plans. Shubir offered to plan the menu for that untimely meal and ended up even writing the recipes. Bernanke told me later that it was the best meal he'd had during his first trip to India. 
when Urmila and I were visiting Washington a couple of years ago, he invited us to dinner at his place. I was deeply touched that he personally cooked the meal for us, Maharashtrian vegetarian for me, and Konkani seafood for Urmila. We went our different ways, our post-RBI lives. Although in touch sporadically, I knew he remained my well-wisher. We last spoke in December last year. Almost the first thing he asked me was, Subha, why have you become so invisible? You don't speak, write, or engage in any ongoing policy developments. I told him I was very much jumping into issues, but not fully clued in on all nuances. Across the phone lines, I could sense the glint of reproach in his eyes. You're being too diffident, he told me. When everyone is commenting on everything, it's a shame that someone with your background and exposure doesn't engage, and I can add, with your writing ability, not engaging. He even emailed me later to urge that I should not deliberately retreat into the background. During the same conversation, he told me without any remorse or fear that he was diagnosed with cancer and also told me the course of treatment he would be following. In subsequent months, we exchanged mails and I was touched by how bravely he fought on even as the end seemed to be closing in. Over the last few weeks, I knew he was going. Even so, when the bad news came, I was immensely saddened. I will carry very fond memories of this wonderful human being who served the country and the economy with great distinction and dignity. Thank you, Rakesh. Suman, would you like to say a few words? And I'm going to call TK, one of his very old associates. Um, Sheikha, I'm uh, honored to be included uh, in this fence, and I'm not sure that the act of letting Subir go from NCR makes, makes me worthy of uh, airtime, particularly when there are people here who worked him, with him longer than I. Um, I would just say that the three attributes I associate with Subir, and this is not only because of the association uh, we had uh, while at NCR, which is brief, really, just about uh, two years, because the first year was under Conrad H's watch, were dignity, personal growth, and professionalism. And I'd just like to provide examples of each of those before handing over uh, to DK, who I also had the privilege of having in NCR, but uh, then worked with uh, Subir at uh, Crystal. Um, I've known, oh, I had known uh, Subir for about the same length of time as Rakesh, just a year less. My first encounter with him was indeed at Nimrana, where um, uh, Rakesh had invited me a month before um, I took over NCR on January 1, 2001. Uh, that would have been to be his second NC, uh, uh, Nimrana conference. And that's when I met Jotsna and also, uh, I think I'm right in saying his daughter, Kanak. And uh, so 2001, 2019, uh, I think Kanak has just finished at NYU, so it's, it's a marker of how much can change uh, in, in 18 years. And indeed, this wonderful auditorium is another marker of how much things can change, have changed, and how much India has changed in those 18 years. But here we're, we're here to celebrate Subir, and I think that the uh, evolution of the Subir here um, in um, 2001, 2002, and the Subir, who I then met uh, on June 18th in Washington, uh, was enormous. So he had a capacity for personal growth, uh, which uh, I think uh, is uh, a lesson to us all. But I want to repeat what people said. While he was an utter professional, there was always the sense of, there was a total absence of bombast. And I think that combination of professionalism, industry, and yet an ability to take yourself not too seriously were, were the qualities that endeared people to him. Um, as I say, uh, I happen to be on a three-month three fellowship in Washington, and um, Rakesh was one of the people, while E.D., who had revived the institution of a South Asia lunch, every Thursday, and so I met Subir re repeatedly um, uh, in, my month, uh, in my period in Washington. 
And you know what it's like when people tell you that somebody has been unwell, uh, you are ginger about it, you don't know what the permissible is, and the, uh, the complete disarming candor with which Subir talked about um, what he'd been through, you know, making it sound, apparently his father had passed away uh, from, the same, um, uh, from the same illness, uh, what he was going through, it just put one completely at ease and was a sign of his own kind of uh, dignity. Um, my last encounter with him was just a bilateral lunch and it is heartbreaking what I think Iknainen has said uh, and I think DK is about to say, which is that even though he'd just come off a round of uh, medication, he was getting ready to visit India. He thought he'd got it licked. So, um, uh, you know, I think the absence of bombast, the absence of self-pity, the naturalness of the man are qualities that I would cite. And um, I guess the final tribute to his dignity uh, uh, I would mention was I called on him at the RBI in those really um, Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, d disgraceful, I suppose. Days where Subir was not sure a week before his term was to come to an end, whether the renewal would come from Delhi or not. And again, the maturity with which he handled that, the maturity with which he handled what was going to come after, those were all marks uh, of, of a man. Um, I would say that that's a, that was a very different Subir uh, from the Subir who left NCAR. Um, and uh, I think we should acknowledge uh, not just how he left us, but how much he grew while he was with us. Uh, Sheikh, let me just say one more. I forgot. Um, I just want to say that um, uh, since you succeeded me, the IMF board, uh, in my encounters at the IMF, in the last few years while he was there, he was very, very widely respected for his interventions and for his thoughtfulness on the board. So he was really very, very, f right from, from, um, from what I understand, across the board from all the executive directors uh, on the board and the managing director, Christine Lagarde, uh, as well. I just uh, thought that I must uh, mention that. DK, may I call on you, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm always at a loss of words uh, <coughs> when I have to speak about him, so I decided to write something down this weekend. Uh, it's indeed true that he didn't smile because when they were preparing for his funeral in US, I got a call from his friend that, do you have a smiling picture of Subi because he spent seven years in Fusil? And I think the, the communications team spent two days and they could dig out one picture where, where, he, was, uh, where he was smiling. Uh, I met him uh, at the same time, almost at the same time when you met him at, in 1999 at NCAR. Uh, later from 2002, uh, we worked together at Crystal for good seven years. Uh, his stint at Crystal was probably the second longest one after IGIDR. I think he spent seven years at Crystal. I met him last on June 21 in Mumbai. Uh, for breakfast and he sounded very hopeful of his uh, uh, recovery and coming back. So all those plans I think he was, he was making and he was inquiring about how to do the house, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, to me, I think he was a mentor and I owe a lot to him as a, uh, in my journey as an economist. I learned a lot from him. Uh, his intellectual prowess, his ability to connect the dots, which Dr. Shubara also mentioned, and to communicate with clarity. I think that's pretty well understood. People experienced him through his writings. Uh, but I think that's the secondary reason why I always remember him and respect him. What stayed with me and will ever always stay with me is human qualities of uh, compassion, large-heartedness, wisdom, and also wit. Uh, I think being with him always reinforced the, the, the virtue of humility within me. Uh, and I think, as, as Dr. Rakesh Mohan also mentioned, I think he treated his co-workers with utmost respect. And uh, that showed his empathy and uh, sensitivity. 
he went out of the way to help him. When I met him uh, in, on, on June 21st, uh, more than a month back, he was inquiring about uh, almost everyone, I think, who had worked in Crystal, how they are doing. And I think and he was also very fondly talking about his driver, I mean, who, uh, who, who who actually uh, wasn't doing well, and then he, uh, not health-wise, but other financially, so he bought him a car, and so he was hoping that he will probably uh, succeed in, uh, in, 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 uh, in making a living out of that. Uh, so uh, when he joined Crystal in 2002, uh, uh, he, I mean, Crystal got a lot of intellectual heft with him. I mean, it was, Crystal was really very fortunate to, uh, to get him, and I think it, helped in making Crystal a credible and respected voice on economic issues. Uh, I still remember in July uh, 2002, it was a very bad monsoon year, and uh, he said that let's do something meaningful, I mean, which will be allow us to gauge the impact of uh, monsoon. And then that was how the, the Crystal Index DRIP, which is Deficient Rainfall Impact Parameter, was born. And within a month, I think it was first published in, uh, in, in Business Standard. And uh, this Saturday, it was again published in Business Standard. I think Business Standard still carries it. So I think that it has, it has I think in Crystal, it has had the longest shelf life among, I mean, among various economic indicators that we did. Uh, he loved travel. I think you mentioned about his car journey. The, actually, he had to dispose his car. And, uh, uh, he, and he had a Maharashtra registration, so he had to take it back there. And so he decided. But he also wanted to visit Gokarna, which is his, uh, uh, where he came from. So what he decided to take his father along, and I, we were really surprised that how would he fit into that first generation Maruti, which looked very, very small compared to his frame. But eventually he did that, and along with that came a number of stories on, on the various eating joints on the way, and also, I think, about, uh, uh, about the conditions of road, etc., infrastructure in general. Uh, but I think uh, uh, his, uh, he was really a foodie. I mean, there's no doubt about it. He also loved cooking. And being with him, working with him for seven years gave me ample opportunity, lunches, dinners. So I think I have, uh, uh, I very fondly uh, remember all of that. Once he jokingly said that if, uh, uh, if he were not an economist, then he probably would have been a cook. And I think his after retirement activity would be running a shack in Goa. So this was obvious, obviously jokingly. Uh, but he really enjoyed good food and did not give up any opportunity he could have for eating, uh, for enjoying that. And I, I think, and there was humor also in that. So I still remember, uh, uh, this was, I think, uh, 2004. Uh, we went to a restaurant in Connaught Place, and uh, they, uh, the, the, uh, so he, he, he told, the, he called the manager and said that the food that you're serving doesn't look like the one that you're advertising. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is uh, uh, so your spiel is very different from your fare. So I need a discount on this. <laughs> and uh, so that guy was like shaken. I mean, he'd never seen uh, uh, something like that. And uh, uh, yeah, so that was, uh, he, I mean, but that never, he never gave up asking for discounts, I mean. So <laughs> same thing happened, I think, uh, uh, this was uh, before that, Abhik, uh, I don't know if he is here. A week, he and I were we had gone to jazz by the bay. He was very fond of jazz, as somebody mentioned. And uh, that day, they were playing sitar there. <laughs> and and uh, so he again called the manager. He says, uh, "Not that I don't like sitar, but uh, it's uh, it's uh, I came here for jazz, and you are you have cut short my experience. So you need to give me a thirty percent discount." <laughs> Uh, so that also never came, but that never stopped him from. So, but it was, I think, it was more about uh, more about uh, his. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it was his sense of humor. I mean, so to say. Uh, I think uh, Bombay, Bombay traffic is very bad, and I think he he observed quite a bit of that. So he once, I think, he wrote in Business Standard and also mentioned it, I think, somewhere else, that a drive from north to south Bombay along the Western Express Highway was an experience that is alternately reassuring and frustrating, because suddenly you get the C-Link and then you get stuck. Uh, I'm sure that he would not have used the word reassuring if he were writing it today, because if you visit Bombay today, it is complete madhouse. And I think he, I can imagine him stomp, I mean, his massive frame, stomping his feet and shaking his head at this, at this, at this state of infrastructure. Shubir was indeed a very, very private person. There's no doubt about it. Uh, but I feel that if he let you in, then it was for good. I mean, that's what I experienced. Uh, and it was indeed my good karma that I had the privilege to know him and work with him. 
uh, his untimely demise is an incredible personal loss and a loss to the world of economics. I'll miss you, Shubir. Thank you, DK. Um, I'm going to ask two of my uh, colleagues, a, a current colleague and a former colleague, who really worked with him very closely. And then I'd like to request those of our guests who would also want to say a word or two. Could I request Poonam Munjal? Yeah, thanks, sir. I, I'll keep it very short because I, I, I thought I'll fumble and I wrote a bit. Uh, but now I, I feel like talking because I think it'll vent, vent, vent it out. So, uh, yeah, I, mm, he was definitely a great researcher, academician, and a person of great intellect. But I will always remember him for his humble, down to earth, and witty nature that everybody has talked about. Uh, I knew him since the time he was in uh, NCAER, but we barely interacted at that time. But uh, when I joined, I had an opportunity. I, I was fortunate enough to work with him for like two years. Uh, I clearly remember when he uh, left Crystal for RBI and we were all very excited. And he was very excited and we were so proud of him. Uh, we had this uh, uh, last uh, Thursday meeting with him. Uh, DK would remember we used to have these weekly meetings and on Thursdays. So that was our last meeting with him when everybody spoke for like two minutes, but uh, some of us could not really speak because, because we choked. I mean, it was so uh, touching and he himself uh, kind of uh, choked for a while. Uh, so I'm now thinking it was just, he, he was moving from Delhi to Mumbai. We could meet any time and it was for good reason, for good place. Still, we were feeling so bad now that he has moved to like another space and um, other dimension, it's really not easy. It's uh, totally uh, unbearable and uh, we'll, we'll definitely miss him. But uh, yeah, one anecdote which I, which I would like to share when, when everybody's talking about how food, I mean, he was so fond of food. Once when um, we had this Thursday meeting, yes, but before that we all thought we'll go out for lunch uh, NFC was the closest place and we all went out. Uh, people in Mumbai, DK and few others, colleague, uh, other colleagues were waiting for this meeting and we thought we'll be back by 2.30 and uh, we'll be on time. But uh, it took little long and uh, so we thought, okay, we'll just text DK that, okay, let's postpone it by another half an hour. Another half an hour also went and then uh, he offered that, I mean, we could have dessert. But then we reminded him, sir, <laughs> we are running late for a meeting. I mean, our boss is with us and he's telling us to have at least dessert first. And then uh, when we reminded him of this meeting, uh, he, he said, uh, never mind, punctuality should not come in way of having dessert. So <laughs> let's go ahead. <laughs> but then I think that embarrassed him himself and uh, uh, we kind of cut it short. I, I so clearly remember. Uh, he took us out so many times and it was really mm, a great, great loss. We'll miss him always. Yeah. Thank you, Poonam. Lavish, give me, give him a microphone. So I, uh, just two instances. Uh, uh, it was my uh, wedding, it was a reception, and I was uh, on the kind of a stage, and uh, Subir walks up after two stiff drinks and proceeds to give me gyan on what are the things I need to do to make my marriage work. Uh, so while, and there was a lot, I know there were quite a few people waiting to, to, to meet with my wife and I. Uh, but I got that five-minute speech, and I have a 20-year very happy marriage, so uh, thanks, Veer. Uh, second, uh, so I was, I decided after a lot of heartache to move on from NCAR. So anyone who knew me at that time would know that I was like fully integrated into the whole ecosystem, yeah. Real emotional uh, time for me. So I thought, you know, I won't be able to go and give my resignation speech and so on, so I should prepare for it. So I had two paragraphs. Uh, one was how I really, really needed to do this. 
my life's calling was somewhere else and so on. And the second one I knew, uh, it was Subir, whom I had connected with amazingly well, and I had done a couple of studies with him. Uh, and uh, it was all about Subir, how much I love you and how it's been great, and da, 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 da. So I had a well-prepared speech, and I go to him, uh, memorized it, and I go to him. And I proceed to tell him that, Subir, now it's time for me to move on, and how I needed more exciting and excitement in my life, and so on. And he's looking there, classic Subir, expressionless face, uh, not even, there was no nod, nothing. It's large frame taking it all in. Um, and then I paused, and then I was going to start the next phase. And as soon as I opened my mouth, he said, now don't you get touchy-feely on me. <laughs> uh, well, I was listening to all of you here, I think, and if Subir is there, uh, that's what he's saying. Don't you get touchy-feely on me. That's Subir classic. Uh, I could say on more and more, but I think it's, that describes Subir to me. Thanks. Thank you, Lavish. Um, uh, I would like to invite any of our guests here, and I see many, including his first employer, Kirit, uh, who I know will have a lot to say about the nine years he spent in Mumbai with you. Kirit? Yeah, I, uh, you know, Subir came first uh, to IJDR in around, I think it was 91 or 92, I forget. And he came to me and said that, look, he's just returned from abroad and he's looking for a job. And uh, uh, we talked about it and I sort of then and then offered him a post. And I said, I can't really give you a formal offer, but we'll make you a visitor. And within uh, two months, I'm sure we'll be able to formalize this. And I was really very happy that I did that. And he was, uh, and we worked on a couple of, actually two projects that together and both were about uh, 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 it was immediately after Manmohan Singh's reforms and budget and the question was that you know what can we learn from the tigers and one can, we used to call the cubs the new tigers in Southeast Asia and what uh, are the lessons we learned and we had a team of about four people I think it was Kunal Sen, uh, Pradeep Agrawal, Subhi Kokan, myself uh, and we did, each one of us did a chapter and put this two together. And Subir did really, was as always, as lots of people said, he was really sit there when, and when we discuss and you only see a smirking smile, almost not quite a smile, but a, a, a breaking of a smile kind of thing. But we had really, we did that project in time and the sponsors were so impressed that an Indian Research Institute is delivering things in time that we, he gave us another project and we also did the same kind of studies about, about policies. But what is really, um, I mean, people have talked about his, his, uh, uh, his smile, less uh, humor and so on and they're really very noticeable. Uh, but one incident that I, I remember about his being a foodie is that, you know, we had uh, really got some hybrid uh, seeds for papaya and we planted in a, our garden and uh, gave excellent papayas, very delicious and very good. But the papayas trees really f uh, propagated and there were lots of papaya trees in the, in the, in the IGIDR campus at that time. And those other papaya trees, which were which had really offspring of this, did not give, uh, did not ripen. And someone was saying, "Let's cut this down." And Subir said, "No, no, no, no. These are extremely useful. I use that all the time to marinate meat, because the papaya juice makes it really tender." And it it was really very very clear that he was a uh, very fond of cooking and very good at it as well. So not just fond, but good at it. And I think it was during his stay at, uh, in IGIDR that he, he met Jyotsna and uh, we had, you know, uh, I would say I was extremely unhappy that uh, Rakesh stole him from us, but nonetheless, uh, it, was, uh, it was a pleasure to have him with, at IGIDR. Thank you, Kirit. Um, would anybody else like to say a few words? Uh, 
let me then close and thank you all for coming. Oh, yes, please. Let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Luis Brewer. I'm the representative of the IMF. I've been in your country for about two weeks. And I don't have the anecdotes, the very warm anecdotes that I've heard with Mr. Golkarn. I haven't, uh, I didn't know him very long. I knew him for about three years in an official capacity. And I dealt with him a lot the last six months but I can relate to many of the things that I've heard here. I've heard him described as an elder, and he was very much an elder to me, not generationally, but in terms of sharing his knowledge about India, about the challenges that India faces. The Indian brand is very much in vogue outside, especially in the West. People look at India with renewed admiration because of its economic performance, because of its culture, because of the role it's playing in the world. But Mr. Golkarn was a very cold and, not cold, but very objective thinker. And he did not get caught up in that uh, wave, but was very realistic in the challenges that the country faces. And he kept going back to the demographic challenge, that India has an opportunity, but it hasn't won the game. It needs to work hard to reap that demographic dividend. And there were challenges in the economy that produced headwinds to the job creation that the new generations require. He was a very warm person. He invited me to a lunch hosting the Indian delegation from the RBI, from the MOF. And I told my colleague in the IMF who brings the missions from Washington to um, India, I'll see you at the lunch with Mr. Golkarn. And he looked at me surprised and said, what lunch? I described the event. He said he never invites IMF staff to these lunches. It's an Indian event where they talk and probably criticize the IMF. So I'm very surprised that you were invited. So I went to the lunch, and Mr. Golkarn introduced me to his lovely wife, very warm, very charming, and incredibly intelligent, uh, an anthropologist. I spent a long time talking about the history of India, the different phases of the civilization, very learned woman. And not having known him and had the experiences that many of you have had with him, I still have two thoughts that stay in my mind when I think about Mr. Golkarn. One is he was very smart. Not only smart, but wise. He knew this country well. And he wasn't pulled by current trends and, and winds of public opinion. He had a very uh, robust way of looking at India. Very objective with a lot of love at the same time. And the second was that he was very warm. And when he passed away, even though it was not surprising to many people, certainly towards the end, it was felt very deeply, both by management. There was a service in Washington a few days later, a few days ago, where you had the top level and many people from the IMF attending, including people from management. And you can rest assured that he was highly respected in the board. He didn't speak long, but when he spoke, people listened. And you've had a first-rate economic diplomat representing your country in the group of nations that are represented in the board of the IMF, and that you should be proud of him. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, let us all um, please. Sure. You can just use the microphone in front of you. Turn it on, please. Uh, I'd like to talk about the lighter side of uh, Suez. Uh, in our Delhi school parties, Subir was always given the task of making the ramp You know, he was incredible at mixing fruits and he was incredible at creating these very, very exotic but the problem was that these parties used to be so big that one drum was not enough. So we used to have about three 
becomes the forefront. And whenever we had these parties, we had to ask to be, you can start drinking when the first round is over and you're in the process of making the second round. So in one of these parties, I think this was when we were passing out of the race uh, the first round got over and I went looking for to be and he was nowhere to be seen. So I saw him sitting outside in the lawn, drinking some whiskey, and I asked Shubir, I mean, this is like breaking the fact. His reply was, the way rum was part of the deal, whiskey wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I've been, uh, I'm not in the world of academics, I run my own business, but I and Shubhi remained in touch for the last 30 years, 35 years. He used to come to our home to play holy. And uh, things started changing the moment he got into prison. Uh, he said, you know, every time these holy parties used to be very wide. So Shubhi said, look, Ravindra, I can take this pink and green streak in my hair. But you know, when I'm traveling these days, people look at me and call me a frustrated old man. <laughs> this is something which I cannot. Uh, you know, when I look back at Shubir, I clearly see that uh, there were two phases of Shubir. There was a phase of Shubir uh, which was in Mumbai, uh, and there was a phase of Shubir which was in Delhi. And I think what made a huge amount of difference to his personality was uh, when Kalak was born. Uh, you know, I keep, I kept discussing this thing with Shubhi that you were a different guy academically before Kalak was born and you became totally different. He became very focused, he became very motivated. I could see his wardrobe changing, I could see his phone changing. And uh, Shubhi, so, you know, we used to joke and say that there is before Christ, so before Kana and after Kana. Uh, tremendous guy, you know, great sense of humor as everyone has expressed. Uh, I think all my colleagues uh, from Delhi School, you know, who spent two years with him, I want to miss him immensely. Uh, I'm sure uh, this element of patronizing, uh, you know, being a mentor to number of people was something which was there even in Delhi School. Uh, a lot of people from his batch have had tremendous amount of uh, me mentoring which has been done by him and um, tremendous guy. Uh, I think all of, all of us are going to mention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me draw this uh, memorial to Subir to a close. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and joining us um, in paying our tributes to this amazing gentleman, friend, compassionate human being, and a scholar to boot. With that, uh, there's a condolence book outside. We'd appreciate if you would uh, put your thoughts down in that, and please join us for tea in the next building. Thank you all for coming.